All right, we'll give stragglers here a second to grab their seats. Uh, good evening, everyone. Before we begin, um, most of our usual housekeeping, uh, please silence your cell phones. And also, we ask that you refrain from any photography, both here and during the awesome book signing that's going to take place immediately after this event in the main lobby. Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, my name is Jason Freeman, and a cool part of this job is getting to introduce writers that you like, and I'm excited to be here tonight to introduce Sarah Val. Uh, praised by the New York Times for her learned, or learned, uh, engagingly discursive, funny, sometimes even jolly romps through American history, cultural critic Sarah Val is a clear-eyed, funny, eviscerating observer of our history, foibles, and feats. She is the author of The Partly Cloudy Patriot, Take the Cannoli, personal favorite, uh, assassination, Vacation, and Unfamiliar Fishes, among other works. Uh, she was a contributing editor for This American Life, as well as one of the original contributors to McSweeney's. Uh, she has also been published uh, in a variety of periodicals, including The Village Voice, Esquire, The Los Angeles Times, and too many others to name. Uh, she has made numerous appearances on The Late Show with David Letterman, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Uh, Sarah's new book offers a frank portrait of the swashbuckling French hero of the American Revolution uh, and his insightful return to our young country. Uh, interviewing Sarah tonight is Wesley Stace, not only a frequent free library guest author, but also one of our favorite interviewers of writers on this stage. I tried counting today, it's six, seven, something like that times he's been here. Uh, he's the author of four critically acclaimed novels, including Misfortune, Charles Jessel considered as a murderer, and most recently, Wonder Kid. You may also know Mr. Stace by his rock and roll nom de plume, John Wesley Harding, who was released, it was 15 last time, it's a gajillion, awesome, uh, smart, fun folk rock albums. Uh, Wes is also the founder of uh, the Cabinet of Wonders radio variety show, which is released a who's who uh, I'm sorry, which has featured a who's who of contemporary musicians, writers, comedians, and other sundry performers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before you uh, join me, uh, Sarah has said she's going to read for a minute, which is terrific for us. Uh, so now, won't you join me in welcoming Sarah Val and Wesley Stace to the Free Library of Philadelphia. <laughs> Hello, Philadelphia, um, and I'd also, um, you know, C-SPAN is here typing, so I'd also like to say hello to the five insomniacs <laughs> watching this at 5 a.m. on a Sunday. Um, I, I just wanted to read um, a little bit um, first because you can see what happens when I can sit and think about what I want to say and how I want to say it before I sit over there and just jibber-jabber, willy-nilly. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just read one little excerpt from the book. I think the only thing, and it's um, toward the end, so uh, the only thing maybe you would want to know uh, is about how the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, our beloved Revolutionary War hero from France uh, who came over in 1777 as a 19-year-old and um, was with Washington's army through Yorktown. In 1824, President Monroe invited the elderly Lafayette um, on the eve of the 50th anniversary of, of the um, revolution to come back to America as the nation's guest, and it was quite a to-do. He, um, well, you remember what a big deal it was in Philadelphia. <laughs> and, you know, when he arrived in New York Harbor, 80-something thousand New Yorkers were there to meet his ship, and the population of New York was, I think, 123,000. So um, he has that on the Pope. Um, <laughs> Most of the book is about his time in the war and a little bit about that return trip, but this is, um, I guess you could call it a tangent. <laughs> Nowadays, Lafayette is a place, not a person. 
Lafayette is a boulevard in Phoenix, a Pennsylvania college, and a bridge across the Mississippi in St. Paul. It's the Alabama birthplace of boxer Joe Lewis and three different towns in Wisconsin, four if Fayette counts. If so, then it is also Fayette County, which the Chicken Ranch, better known as the best little whorehouse in Texas, put on the map. It is without question Lafayette, Indiana, where the founders of both C-SPAN and Guns N' Roses were born. When I bumped into an old neighbor whilst visiting my Montana hometown, she asked me what I was working on, and I answered a book about Lafayette. So she inquired if I would be spending a lot of time in Louisiana. And I was confused, wondering if she forgot that Thomas Jefferson decided against his initial impulse of appointing Lafayette as the former French colony's first governor after the Louisiana Purchase. But then I realized that the city of Lafayette, Louisiana must be her go-to Lafayette labeled noun. <laughs> Even though from Montana, it's actually a closer drive to Lafayette, Utah, not to mention the ones in Oregon, California, Kansas, and Colorado. So I explained that I meant Lafayette, the French teenager who crossed the Atlantic on his own dime to volunteer to fight with George Washington in the Revolutionary War. Therefore, I said, I was more likely to visit Pennsylvania, where he got shot. <laughs> she nevertheless professed her fondness for Zydeco. <laughs> this encounter aroused such indignation in my breast that I moralized upon the instability of human glory and the evanescence of many other things. No, wait, that's what Herman Melville did in 1870 when a random stranger in a cigar store had never heard of his Revolutionary War hero grandfather. When I found out my old neighbor had never heard of my Revolutionary War hero protagonist, I went and got a taco with my sister. <laughs> Still, it does seem eerie how one day in 1824, two-thirds of the population of New York City was lining up to wave hello to Lafayette, and 19 decades go by, and all that's left of his memory is the name of a Cajun college town. Thanks to the nationwide euphoria over the elderly Lafayette's return tour of the United States in 1824, countless American streets, parks, cities, counties, schools, warships, horses, and babies bear his name. The long list includes Scientology founder Lafayette Ronald L. Ron Hubbard and my Arkansas-born great-great-uncle Lafayette Hines, who went by fate for short. The most meaningful namesake by far is Lafayette Square across the street from the White House, also known as Lafayette Park. This is the nation's capital of protest, the place where we, the people, gather to yell at our presidents. <laughs> or as um, George H.W. Bush once complained to Parade Magazine during the Gulf, Gulf War, um, he complained of the demonstrators who were beating those damn drums in front of the White House when I was trying to have dinner. <laughs> of all the rally sit-ins and acts of civil disobedience staged at Lafayette Square over the decades, I think we can agree that the one Americans should be the most proud of is the gathering of the Ku Klux Klan there in 1982. The three dozen or so, stay with me, the three dozen or so white supremacist dunderheads who showed up to demonstrate were provided police protection against the hordes of agitated counter protesters pouring into the Capitol to demonstrate against their demonstration. Freedom of expression truly exists only when a society's most repugnant nitwits are allowed to spew their nonsense in public. And in Lafayette Park, distasteful speech is literally permitted, with permits issued by the National Park Service, the federal agency managing the site. It goes on from there, but, um, you know, you can read that later. <laughs> Shall I come over to... Yeah. Oh, oh, you're holding it like Oprah or something. Or like Robert Plant. Hmm.
because yours yeah. is, it's both. You, it can, you, you can just have yours then. Yeah, thanks. Um, Don't tell me what to do with. No, no, no. Um, so do you think, uh, when I'm listening to that, Lafayette, would you think of him now, despite all those things that are named after him, those towns and the, the, the glory that comes with that kind of latter-day fame, mm -hmm. do you think of him now as an obscure character and, in a sense, was part of your point with the book with, like, you know, trying to let people know about him? Um, Wes is British. I don't know if you can tell. Uh, he hated British people. Well, I was going to say many historical figures in America are obscure figures because we don't remember anything, you know? So, yes, he's obscure, but, I mean, I guess... Maybe you should check with your teenagers if they know who, like, Ben Franklin is or something. Um, so is he an obscure figure? He has become one. I mean, he used to be this, he, I mean, maybe it was just the um, after effects from that trip in 1824, but I don't know if many of you have been to the Lafayette Monument in the Brandywine Valley that is, uh, a little lamp look, a uh, street lamp looking thing off the side of a road, but it's like Nowheresville in near West Chester. That sounds like a town, right? Um, and it's like in a lady's yard. I met her, she was really nice. And, but when they, when they built that monument in 1895, after he had been dead for like 60 years, in 1895, 5,000 people showed up to celebrate this not very impressive, no offense, um, <laughs> monument being put up. So um, I think, and then, you know, maybe the culmination of the Lafayette legend comes in World War I when, um, you know, France was in a bit of a pickle. And uh, when, the, when the American, the Allied Expeditionary Forces under General Pershing came, to uh, help out our old allies, the French, against the Germans. And they marched into Paris and they marched straight to Peak Pou Cemetery where Lafayette is buried. And um, one of the officers famously said, Lafayette, we are here. But after that, um, you know, people got busy. New, new heroes. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was Hitler. Different you know. wars. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he, in the, he used to be a, a bigger deal, obviously. Um, and he's, I'm not one of those writers who, I mean, I've certainly read some of these books where, you know, where the writer is like, my subject is so important. If he had never been born, there would have been a zombie apocalypse, you know. I mean, he was important and certainly fascinating enough that, I mean, I wasted three years on him. Uh, <laughs> So he's up there, but I mean, in the revolutionary generation, it's kind of an embarrassment of riches. You know, you've got your Washington, your Jefferson, your beloved hometown boy Franklin. Um, you know, people are excited about Alexander Hamilton these days. Um, I'm maybe more partial to Henry Knox, the chief artillery officer. You just have, um, you know, John Adams. What about John Adams? James Madison. I mean, like. It's, e I mean, even, I mean, it's, there, there's a lot of talent there, you know? But you're going for Knox. I mean, he's got to be the hipster's choice, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, he is, he's definitely the writer's choice right. because Henry Knox, as you know, uh, was uh, famously a bookseller in Boston, the owner of the London bookshop. And um, he joined up with the, um, with the militia in, Ma in Massachusetts and eventually, uh, you know, when that morphed into the Continental Army, he was the guy during the siege of Boston who walked up, he was, he was a, I mean, think about the guy you buy your books from while I'm telling this story. Um, hopefully it's still a guy or a lady in a store. Um, yay! And uh, so, the book guy walks up to Washington and, I mean, 
you know, there's a siege in Boston, and the British control the little peninsula of the city of Boston itself, but they're surrounded by all of these patriot militias that have kind of morphed into the Continental Army. And, um, and they get word that uh, Ethan Allen and um, Benedict Arnold who we still like at this point, have captured Fort Ticonderoga, which still has all these cannons and mortars and howitzers left over from the French and Indian War. And, um, and so in order to break this stalemate, they need not just better weapons, they need some weapons. And uh, the thing about heavy artillery is it's heavy. And Henry Knox goes up to Washington and he says, my brother and I will go get that stuff. It's, you know, 300 miles away across the Berkshire Mountains and it's winter. And Washington's like, go ahead, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, a few weeks later, here the Knox brothers show up and they built these special sleds and they hauled, I don't know how many hundreds of tons of heavy artillery over the Berkshires to Boston and then the crafty Washington and, and his men in the middle of the night put them up on Dorchester Heights. And then the British down in Boston wake up the next morning impressed and <laughs> they they leave by ship to Canada never to return and so the moral of that story is never underestimate an independent bookseller <laughs> which side the bread is buttered on. <laughs> okay, well, look, we'll, we'll get back to all this Lafayette stuff. In a yeah. Um, but, let, but I have a couple of questions. One is, it's just struck me when you Unless were Unless you're a Quaker, which is possible in this town. It's, it's probable. And I'm, I'm sorry that I was just glorifying violence. <laughs> Mostly. Okay, go ahead. Um, that was a disclaimer. Let's come back to the Quakers in a moment. There's a lot about Quakers Can in we? your book. <laughs> um, so, uh, just your description of the Quaker meeting. We'll need to go to, to, to that. Yeah, but that'll be, we should have one. That'll be great on C-SPAN. We should just do it now. Just like a whole room full of people. No, that's what Q&A is going to be <laughs> like. Good. Like, no one's going to say no anything. No one says anything, and it's just the sound of a bunch of sneezes. Yeah. <laughs> denim on denim. Yeah, and the, the visuals will just be like people look, trying not to make eye contact. <laughs> Subtitle, nobody moved to ask the question. <laughs> what, what, you know, what, you know, you must do a lot of, obviously, a lot of research on your books. There must be big fat books there mm -hmm. on, on your subject that you read, obviously. Mm -hmm. And what you are doing as, as <laughs> Now I've dubbed you the hipster historian. I'm just going to keep going with it. Don't. No, okay. But what, but what you, what you're doing is, you know, you're taking the facts and you're taking the the urge to educate a little and the urge to amuse people because you are, you know, a comic writer also, and you're taking your love of the history. And the first question I want to ask is, obviously, it's all an expression of you, but in what order do those things kind of topple out of you when you, you know, first thought of Lafayette? Are you waiting for the, the spark of an idea to come to you? Uh, and then when it does come, how, how do you keep those things in balance while you're doing it? Because that's what we love about you. I writing. use an egg timer. No, I, I don't know. Like, it goes like, okay, I'm going to be educational now. Ding! Time for a jolty doke. Um, no, uh, I mean, those books you're talking about, <laughs> the funny thing is, is, I mean, I, I call them the books Republican dads get for Christmas, you know? <laughs> the, like, single subject book about a person. It's usually, like, the oh, title... the biography The title of yeah. the... Yeah, it's a doorstopper, yeah. and yeah. usually the title is, like, a person's name. And then, you know, when someone asks them, what's the book about, and then they'll say the person's name. Yeah. <laughs> they won't have this, like, weird word, like, somewhat in their title that you're just like, oh, my God, that's going to take 45 minutes to unravel. Um, I always kind of, like, in the beginning, that's sort of what I think I'm going to do, write this straight story. And, like, with, with Lafayette... I had written a little short piece um, for This American Life on public radio about that return trip, and it was very sentimental and 
fizzy and it was all about, it was just kind of a love story and about uh, the American people's affection for Lafayette. And I just thought I was going to write this nice book about this nice French boy. And then, I don't know what, I mean, I never really think things through enough, I guess. I mean, for one thing, there's a war that he's in, so that's no fun. And then, I mean, the reason I was drawn to him was because, I mean, in 1824, the Civil War is kind of like starting to bubble up, you know. I mean, basically, it's now that I think about it, like the Civil War is bubbling up, you know, across town at Independence Hall in 1774, like right at the beginning. And so the thing, like at Independence Hall, you know, the First Continental Congress, first thing that happens, the guy says, we should start with a prayer. Second motion is two Episcopalians standing up and saying, no way, I'm not going to, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not going to pray with these Quakers and Baptists and Congregationalists. We can't pray together. We have too many religions. Um, right there, at the moment of, you know, the official founding, basically, um, <laughs> they're all like, we can't get along. <laughs> I mean, that maybe the third thing that should have happened was, let's all go home and save everyone the trouble. So anyway, I was drawn to him because uh, that's, because he, because he was French, Lafayette, um, Everyone loved him, north, south, left, right. He was just kind of this other, you know, like everybody's uncle from across the sea. And I thought it would be nice to write a sweet, simple story about this person everyone loved. And then in order to tell that story, pretty much at every step in the research, he gets here, like, um, I mean, he's here for maybe five months and he writes George Washington a letter from across the camp at Valley Forge, basically saying, I feel like America can defend it herself. Um, like you can fight the British if you would just stop fighting with each other because all they do is bicker, the Congress can't get anything done, they disagree on everything. The Congress and the army are at odds. There's a conspiracy within the Congress and the Army um, to oust George Washington. So George Washington spends a few hours a day fighting the British and a few hours a day trying to keep his job from the people who are undermining him, his friends. Um, and, and then, you know, writing about that trip in 1824, the 1824 election was in full swing when Lafayette arrived. It's it's the most divisive presidential election in American history. There's no, there's a, Andrew Jackson wins the popular vote, but no one wins the electoral college. And so um, it ends up being decided by the House per the Constitution, and, um, but through what comes to be known as the corrupt bargain. So everything's a mess. And then when I'm researching, I just want to go to my little battlefields to see where my French boy got shot. And, uh, it happened to be in the fall of 2013 when the government shut down. So Independence Hall was closed, Yorktown Battlefield closed. And so like it, this, all of this flav ended up flavoring the story and it, the book kind of became two books, maybe three if you count the fact that I sort of use Lafayette as a personification of the French alliance in general. So it's sort of, it, it just um, expanded its waistline, you know. It was going to be one of those. This happened to him, this happened to him, then he died. But, you know, it's a, a, lot, of, a lot of your writing um, is, is dependent... And then I met some Quakers who distracted me. Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of your writing, obviously, is, you know, dependent on your personality. It's, it's filtered through you, and you're very much part of it. You like going to places. You like telling us about the people you meet. Yes. You like, Wes um, went with me to one of the places, Valley Forge. I did. That's true. That's true. We'll get, we'll get on to that in a moment. I can tell you... <laughs> the inside story yeah. of Sarah Bell's writing. Um, so and how we had a fantastic lunch at Han Dynasty after That's that. That's true. In I recommend the cucumber. Yes, excellent. Um, but uh, but uh, what I wanted to do, uh, what, go, just going back a little bit. Because See, I'm doing it to you. You have this like set of questions you want answered, and I just keep like interrupting you. That's true. You're terrible. And I just You're keep, terrible at interviewing me. Like, ter <laughs> tangents and you know, distracting I, you. I want to take you back to, I want to imagine mm -hmm. Sarah Val 
at school and her relationship to history. What did that, ha what happened that now, that this is what you write now? I when did it first, gra something must have... I have two images of me and American history class. One of them is me skipping it to go to the public library to read. <laughs> and the other one is sitting there with the boring teacher at the blackboard and one kid uh, making a break for it and jumping out the window and running away. Uh, I think like my, my interest in history and my kind of identification with it and fascination comes from my family background and... Um, Tell us more. I mean, you know, both of my parents have ancestors who were Cherokee and were on the Trail of Tears and the United States government marched them at gunpoint to Oklahoma. And it was just a topic of conversation in the family. And then also at the Cherokee capital um, in Tahlequah in Oklahoma, every summer when I was a kid, we would go there and watch. They had a, one of those amphitheater outdoor pageants. So every summer I was a kid, I watched. I, I mean, and also, I mean, we, we lived... I had a very rural childhood, and there, it was the only theater I ever saw, you know, till I was maybe 14 or something. So I literally watched history come alive every summer. And this one story was so kind of present in the family, partly because um, my father was, he hated Oklahoma, and he hated that he was born there, and it was Andrew Jackson's fault. And, you know, this historical tragedy made made it so that he was born in this place he hated. So, you know, he had a bit of a bone to pick with Andrew Jackson about that. So I think the, that um, this world this historical... This is all making sense now. Yeah, so this world historical event that had happened to my... I mean, it was in 1838, it's not really that long ago, um, that it happened to our not-so-distant ancestors. That always made history seem like something that happened to people like us, you know, it wasn't just this distant thing. And I don't think school really had much bearing on any of that. I think partly because I was never one for textbooks. Right. I always wanted to read book books, and that's why I was skipping school all the time to go to the public library. But I mean, not, you know, not to, not to psychoanalyze, but what, that there's such a clear line between you feeling that your family was directly affected by history and the kind of history that you're writing for us nowadays of which you are very very present in the writing of yeah um yeah i mean it wasn't just that too i think it was maybe just the way my family was like it wasn't just that story you know like the civil war we had um, my great great grandfather fought in that, and you know, because the Cherokees uh, owned slaves, he was. I'm technically el eligible to be a member of the Daughters of the Confederacy because the Cherokee sided with the Confederacy. So that was just like, you know, my grandfather knew that guy, you know. Um, and then, you know, my family's from Oklahoma, and, you know, like, Pretty Boy Floyd left $20 under the dinner plate when he, like, you know, came by in his Studebaker or whatever. So history just seemed like one of the things you talked about because mm. it was one of the things that happened to actual people. I mean, I've noticed that maybe especially with that Cherokee thing, like, and with the Quakers, too, that I met, um, you know, they were incredibly well-informed about the Revolutionary War. Like, not only, like, most people I would talk to um, had a like vague notion of who Lafayette was if they did it all and the Quakers they knew exactly who he was and they had a problem with him and by extension me you know <laughs> and like we were talking about that and one of the Quakers said um, that sectarian groups tend to know their history. Uh, that quote actually kind of leapt out at me when I was reading the book. And I found that like my last book was on um, 
the United States takeover of Hawaii in the 19th century, and the people who were the most educational for me when I was researching that book were the native Hawaiian sovereignty as, um, activists, the people who are still protesting the American annexation of Hawaii in 1898, and they, I, they were, I learned so much from them. So, um, and I've noticed like one of the, like one program I think on TV where history filters into a lot of the stories is the family sitcom Blackish, you know, and where it's about this middle class black family and, you know, thing like there's a whole episode about Martin Luther King Day and how they go skiing on Martin Luther King Day and, and how the different generations are relating to these stories, you know, or there was that whole episode about the N word. And I think like history, or there was one episode recently about, you know, a family member who was hesitant to visit a physician, and there was a whole thing about um, uh, Tuskegee and the experiments on black people, and it was basically like a little documentary at the beginning. So I think people who come from, who descend from, you know, people who have been left out or mm. wronged in some way tend to be... Um, very focused on history yeah. because they're still upset about it, you know, and usually for good reason. And, and you, so, so you're one of the few Americans, because you're so engaged with history, who aren't envious of the fact that my history in my country goes back so much further. <laughs> you know, um, I, was, I remember I was speaking at the, there's an American high school in Paris, and it's basically like an international school, and I, and I remember this kid, I was telling them about what they do and that I write about American history. And this one kid was like, I don't understand that. There's only like 400 years of it. Like, I, I'm like, well, a lot happened, you know. I but I think of like your history is my history too, you know. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. There are... I mean, I've actually spent a lot of time writing about how British Americans are, and that's not necessarily a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to let you know the woe of my education, uh, a very convenient place to start English history is with the Tudors after the Wars of the Roses, right? And so when I went to my first school, that was where we started, and I did about two years of that. And then when I, I was taken away from that school for various reasons, went to another one, started there again, and then when I went to the school after You're I graduated missing from out one, on Boudicca. all I know about is the Tudors. I did it three times in my I'm education. I'm telling you, Boudicca, look her up. Oh, yeah. Well, she, yeah. yes, she's, she's cool. Uh, it was the moment, uh, the moment when she stopped being called Bodicea and started being called Boudicca. That was the big moment in her history. Plus, what about, I mean, I, what about, the, what about um, Magna Carta? Great prog band, one of my favourites. <laughs> uh, so let's talk. Let's talk about. Let's talk about writing for a bit. I recently had the pleasure to. I, I reviewed a book uh, for the TLS, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of writing about Hank Williams, mm -hmm. and a fantastic uh, piece by you that I quoted from. Uh, in the review uh, that you wrote for someone in San Francisco, I presume, um, about What's the Hank mean? Williams, some box set. That I think that out. might have been for the Village Voice. Yeah. It was a wonderful piece of writing, but mm -hmm. I think you know we know uh, you know this American life and and your books and stuff. But you know, I think you did you kind of start off as a music writer, maybe? Yeah, it's pretty much. I mean, I well, I I um I used to be way artsier, and. I studied art history in school, and then I started writing actually uh, for my college newspaper. That's how I started writing, and I, I actually started writing about visual art because I just felt like the art reviews in the Montana State University newspaper could be better. Yeah. And, and I decided I should give it a whirl, and then um, uh, then I after school I wrote, wrote for some art magazines a little bit and did book reviews. And then I moved into music, partly because um, uh, of Grill Marcus, the music writer. He, he was the one I interviewed him for my college paper, and he kind of got me my first job in journalism, writing for Art Forum. Mm. And so through him, I mean, he was like the only writer I had ever met, you know. So um, I met a lot, and I had, a, I had been a college radio DJ, so I had sort of a background in music. So I started writing 
record reviews and for places like Spin and then writing for um, weekly newspapers and stuff about music. I mean, mostly the first 10 years as a writer, I would just, I mean, I would write anything. You know, I would write, I mean, it was like a record review, a book review, a column, an interview, a radio documentary. I just did as much as I could. And I think that's great. Looking back, it's great for the experience. But also, everything paid so poorly. Mm -hmm. I just had to do as much as I could. And I always had so many different interests. Um, but uh, yeah, writing about music was, um, that was, I remember though, I mean, I always loved music, but some, sometimes I think I was writing out of adjectives, you know, <laughs> in record reviews. And, uh, and also, I think I was becoming a nicer person, you know, which made it harder to be a critic, like an honest critic, I think. Like, I remember at one point toward the end, I was reviewing a Slayer record for Spin, mm. and it was obviously terrible. But I felt so bad about saying that. I, I just, I was like, but the drums are mic'd really well, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I had exactly the same experience reviewing a, the I've only reviewed one novel mm -hmm. and I'll never do it again because yeah. I felt I couldn't be honest about the book I felt too bad about doing it I don't feel so bad about non-fiction somehow though. Hmm. but novelists well novelists I feel very protective yeah, of them yeah they're just little delicate flowers <laughs> and, then, and then these non-fiction bullies they, yeah. they deserve what yeah, they get yeah exactly <laughs> um so what came first then after, I mean, you know, we know you from broadcasting, we know you from voiceovers, we know you from a string of books, you know, what was the, what was the thing that um, first took off for you? Let's put it that way. Oh, that first took off. Well, I mean, know, took off. What about This American Life? When did you start working <laughs> with This American Life? When did you start doing I stuff mean, it for all like It all seemed like a progression at the time. It, this is making me sound like I have multi -per multiple personality disorder now. I mean, I... I mean, and it's always like one thing. So, like, um, I started working on This American Life because I had met Ira Glass when I was writing my first book, which was a diary of listening to the radio for a year, which is not a task I recommend doing. Um, and I had started writing that book because uh, it was 1990. It was 19. It was 1994. And um, remember that midterm uh, congressional election that year? And that was when the Ditto Head Caucus, uh, those charmers, took over the Congress. And they were calling themselves that because they were very proud uh, to owe their allegiance to Rush Limbaugh. And they felt like this, that Rush Limbaugh and um, talk radio people like him had um, you know, won them this revolutionary election. And I had never listened to Rush Limbaugh. No one I knew listened to Rush Limbaugh because I just hang out with Namby Pamby people like this, you know? <laughs> and I, I just thought radio is having this huge effect on the country and no one was writing about it. There were no like radio critics and newspapers the way other arts or media are covered. And so I thought, I, want, I wanted to write about this, so I just started, I just turned on the radio and started listening. I heard some really dispiriting things. <laughs> but, but, and then, because I was writing that book, and then I had moved to Chicago to go to school, and I met Ira Glass, and then, um, you know, then I, I had just become friends with him, and I was writing for one of the local papers in Chicago, and, um, I was having dinner with Ira, and I told him I, I, had, I had written a book review about um, a, a, a record guide, a book of, you know, um, music reference book. And um, I had gotten a thank you letter from this random guy in Chicago thanking me because I had mentioned the Fastbacks, the great old Seattle punk band. Of course. You know them. Of course. And uh, this guy thanked me for mentioning them. Just a guy, he wasn't in the band. And then he enclosed in his thank you letter this book he had made. I mean, this was sort of, I guess maybe Al Gore had invented the internet by that point, but more, normal people didn't have access to it. So now we're used to, because of the internet, we're used to all the many splendored corners of obsession in the world and its expression by random people in their basements, but at the time, 
I, he had sent this book he had written that was all about the fast specs with all these pie charts. <laughs> as, you know, as you know, the fast specs went through a lot of drummers. And many, many, many drummers. drummers. And he, there were these charts about, like, Rusty played on 15% of the songs. Mike Musburger. Yeah, Mike, Mike Musburger, you know. And, um, the I guy was, from Guns N' Roses. Yeah, he was their drummer for That's a bit. right. Duff McKagan Duff was McKagan the first drummer of the Fastbacks. He was in there, sure. Of this course. is good stuff, C Span. Yeah. <laughs> Wait till, we, wait till we ring up Kurt Block and tell, yeah. tell him what's on C-SPAN. Oh my god, Kurt Block, that guy should run for president. Um, he's the guitar player. Um, and songwriter. And songwriter. We can stop now. We yeah. can stop. Anyway, I was just having dinner with Ira and I was like, you can't believe this letter I got. And he's like, oh, this guy lives in Chicago? He's like, I'll just, uh, I'll give you a tape recorder. It wasn't even, would you like to work for my radio show? It was just like, I'll give you a tape recorder. That was the whole conversation. It was just like, of course you're going to go to this guy's apartment <laughs> and talk to him about his obsession, you know. And that's how that started. Oh, that, that was a piece, was it? That, that was, was my your... first piece. Oh, my goodness, I'd love to hear that. No, oh, it's probably on the internet now. <laughs> I don't have that. Yeah. So anyway, I, like things always, you know, and that was, I guess you could say that came out of me working for that paper, yeah. writing reviews. Well, I'm, I'm and then I started nice... working on that show and doing more stories. And then, I, and then I made a documentary on, I hate to keep bringing this up, The Trail of Tears. Mm. And that changed my life because that was the first, like, American history story I had done. And I loved it. I mean, I loved, I mean, it was hard because a lot of people died in the story. That but was, it's the personal connection. Yeah, it was the personal connection. But, I mean, it, it's interesting, like, that story, I, I was doing what I was going to be doing the rest of my life right away, which was, it was a road trip. It was, it was a documentary of driving the whole trail with my twin sister. And so... Um, we went to places along the way, and it was kind of, it turned out, I mean, basically what I've always been writing about is America and American culture in some form or another, whether I was writing about Hank Williams or writing about, you know, New England missionaries to Hawaii or whatever. And that trip, it was, it seemed to me like the perfect way to talk about not just American history, but America itself, because it was a road trip. So we would stop. And, you know, we, would, we were crying every day because every time we would stop, it would be, like, where more people were buried along the way. Like, 4,000 people died along that trip, which was about a fourth of the tribe. So every, every day we would drive, we would stop, we would stand. I mean, sometimes there were literal graves and cry. And then, because it was a road trip, we would go get barbecue or, you know, or we would listen to Chuck Berry or at one point, you know, going to Chattanooga, which was one of the starting points for, like, the Trail of Tears doesn't start in one place. It just starts wherever Cherokee were living and they were kicked out from there and some of them were in Chattanooga. And there, um, we stayed at the Chattanooga Choo Choo, you yeah. know, yeah. and it was like really fun to say choo choo all day long. Mm -hmm. So we were having the, this like we would cry and then it would be a fun road choo -choo. trip. And it always like later on, um, I remember reading what uh, the novelist uh, Steve Erickson, uh, I think, wrote that the the two great inventions of America are annihilation and fun. I mean, he was just, because he was writing about the nuclear tests in the Nevada desert in Vegas, you know? And so, like, on that trip, it would be, like, Indian genocide barbecue, you know? Um, uh, racism, watching the X-Files with my sister in a motel room, you know? So, like, the whole thing seemed... Because this country is both of those things. It's annihilation and fun, you know. So I, I think, like, it's such an extreme place. Well, and the book, and the, the new book's a, a good example of that too, isn't it? Because the, a lot of the things you're doing are fun things to be doing. Yeah. And yet what I'm we a, were doing, what we were doing when we person. were... person. Well, you know, what we were doing when we were on the Valley Forge site was we were in a place where there had been incredible devastation and deprivation and we saw that 
bizarre movie about everything uh, that they show at the Valley Forge battle site. Some of you might have seen it. And uh, yet we were having quite an enjoyable time. Uh huh. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah, certainly. Because I didn't really know what we were looking at, so you were able to explain it all to me. <laughs> that worked out well. Yeah, so, I mean, one reason I, I invited Wes, because, you know, he's British, and I thought, oh, this will be fun to be with a British person and just, like, rub it in all day, you know? <laughs> but as it turned out, like, he, like, knew nothing about the Revolution no War idea. because they don't care about it. They don't learn we about it. We lost it. We don't want to know about it. He was just like, I think it's just, it was just like a colony that was lost. Yeah, I did. So he robbed me of what was supposed to be my greatest fun of the day. If, you, if you'd only alerted me to that, <laughs> I could have acted it a lot better. Yeah, I just remember um, there's that big monument at Valley Forge with all the names of all the, you know, generals like Lafayette and um, Steuben and, oh, DeKalb. DeKalb. DeKalb Green. And, Green and and um, we were talking about it later and Wes, those are people, you know, and Wes was like, you know, that big monument thing with all the Brooklyn streets on. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, we just focused on the wars we won, which there are a lot of those. Well, some with your help. Now, um, somebody said actually a very funny thing. So the, you know. Lafayette. Did we say, is it Lafayette or Lafayette? Let's just get that right. I mean, I say Lafayette unless I'm saying Lafayette. It's okay. kind of like, you know that song, um, um, I was dancing at the lesbian bar. Yes, Jonathan, Jonathan Richmond, Richmond, And he sure. says both laissez-faire and laissez-faire. Does he in the same song? Mm -hmm. That's very... It's kind of like that, I think. Okay, well, because of the gallery, because if in you're the, in like, France, French, I think if you're in France, I think it's the La gallery Fayette. Lafayette. Yeah, yeah the gallery, because he's got that whole shopping <laughs> thing named after him in Paris as well. Yeah, I don't think he got any of the back end on that. Well, <laughs> maybe his family did. Somebody, it's, there's a very good quote. So he was French. He came over to... Someone sitting in their underwear and like, I just wanted to watch C-SPAN. Like, real C-SPAN. I think they're getting their money's worth here. Um, when they, the, the cultural references from Jonathan Richmond to the Fastbacks have been so wide-ranging. Oh, so wide-ranging. We've wide got indie, well, indie rock covered. Yeah, but so, really. but so, so Lafayette mm -hmm. was a Frenchman who came over to America to fight a war against the British. Right. And somebody says very cleverly in your book, so you're writing about a Frenchman who got muddled up in a war on a continent far away from where he was from against a country very close to where he was from. It's like somebody from Ukraine battling Russia in Brazil. That was, was, that, was that you, Wes? Did you say that? Oh, it is me, actually. Yeah, yeah sorry. That, yes. Um, I mean, one reason, one reason, yeah. Thanks. It's always, I love it when people quote themselves. <laughs> uh, you know what? Shall I tell you the honest thing about that? Yeah. I don't think I said that. I think you improved whatever I said. No, you said that. Did I say that? Yeah. That sounds too, too... I said to my friend, when you read this bit of the book, I think there's one bit that doesn't sound like me. And it sounds too good for me, that bit. That bit about Ukraine and Brazil, I'm not yeah. even sure I know where those places are. Do we need to compliment you further? Uh... <laughs> It's all about you. Yeah, so. it is all about me. So what we would like to do, I mean, we, I could go on talking to you for hours, but what we should do, mm -hmm. because of the signaling that I see so frantically occurring, <laughs> is to take some You know, questions. the signaling, it's like when Kurt Block plays the guitar, jumping up and down. Yes, that's right. Well... Three what we need, though, what we need you to do, because if you would like your, if you'd like to ask Sarah a question, please do so. If you would like that question to be heard on the podcast or on on the television, uh, then please wait until the microphone gets to you, even if you think you can shout loud enough. So, does anybody have a question for Sarah? There's one right there. That gentleman there. The microphone is coming towards him now. I, I would like to thank Wes and also say he really did prepare questions about the actual book. 
and I kind of kept dis derailing you. I d well, I, I just like to ask one good question at the beginning and then have a chat. Yeah. I think that's what the people want. I mean, what are they going to do, fire us? <laughs> Nothing's worse than a question master with an agenda. I yeah. Can tell you that. And my only agenda is keeping you talking because it's so entertaining. Let's have the question. <laughs> So yeah. I've been thinking all day about what question I wanted to ask Sarah Val. And mm -hmm. in, uh, when you That's went on more the, than Wes yeah, put into yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you come up with? So uh, when you went on the Trail of Tears grand tour. Um, Are you ever going to get over that? No. Well, when you wrote about it in your book, you mm -hmm. titled it, What I Think of When I See the $20 Bill. Mm -hmm. so I think I are, know where you're going with this. People Go are talking about, you know, putting a woman on the $10 bill, but leaving the $20 bill alone. So I'm wondering, first, what did you think when you heard that news? And who do you think should be on either of those two bills? Hmm. I mean, yeah, the, like uh, the $10 bill, as I recall, uh, they're not going to com they're not going to completely ditch Hamilton right one of the proposals is there will be two or there will be two pictures on it or there'll be two separate ten dollar bills I don't know but yeah why the ten why Hamilton um, you know everybody loves a treasury secretary <laughs> uh, but like the Andrew Jackson one I, I mean people are talking about it um, and I would, I mean, I would love for, I would love to get rid of him on the 20 because it's really distracting, you know? Like, say you're just, say you have the afternoon off and you and your sister are like gonna go see the new Tom Cruise movie and you got your popcorn and you're paying for it and then you have to look at the face of the guys whose policy, you know, ruined your ancestor's life. Like, puts a damper on things, right? <laughs> so, I mean, if they want a woman, I mean... Well, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not completely opposed to everything about Jackson, but there's just something, um, I mean, I'm against nullification like everyone else here. Um, but, uh, you know, um, what was I going to say? Uh, if you were going to have someone on the 20, oh, right. who yeah. might you like to have? Well, I grew up in Montana, and our great, you know, heroine in Montana is Jeanette Rankin. I think her her name's being bandied about. She's the first um, she's the first female congressperson. I thought it was and a she's... detective writer. <laughs> and uh, she is she's the only um, member of Congress who voted against um, entry into World War One and World War Two. And even though I think most people in Montana, I would say most people are kind of on board with World War II, everyone, when I was growing up there, everyone was always so proud that she voted her conscience, you know. And then when I was a teenager in the 80s in the um, anti-nuclear movement, you know, she was like our great hero because she had been like, um, she had just been a great peace activist her entire life up through the Vietnam War. There's a statue of her in my hometown. Um, she's um, one of the great heroes of Montana. And whether you agree with how she voted or not, she held her ground and it was not a popular stance, you know, especially with World War II. So she is, I think, a person of character and quality. And, you know, I wouldn't mind looking at her when I was buying junior mints or something. Um, <clears throat> there was another question right back there. Yes. And here comes the microphone. Um, so I haven't had a chance uh, to read your book yet, but that's I okay. I just came out yesterday. <laughs> what? Did, what were you doing last night? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was studying for a test, but um, I know I did buy it, but I wasn't able to start it. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I was wondering. Um, did you take the test yet? Yes, I did. How did you do? Uh, I got a an A. Oh, well, then it was worth it. <laughs> so um, so uh, I study uh, 
early American history, Revolutionary mm -hmm. War. And uh, I was wondering if there's anything, uh, when you were reading the correspondence between, um, as they were lovingly called, the gay trio, the uh, John Lawrence, Alexander Hamilton, and uh, Lafayette, I was wondering if there was anything um, that you read that was like, really, uh, like a lot of the personal stuff is kind of left out of a lot of the history books, like the biographies. I know, I was just so focused on accomplishments and achievements and not who was making out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was, well, I was wondering if there was anything. Um, oh, I remember when we were at Valley Forge and we asked the ranger, like, Remember we asked, the, there's that house that Washington stayed in yeah. and that also Hamilton and Lawrence were staying in and, and we asked him and he didn't really want to talk about that. No, he was quite off put by that question. Um, no, I mean I did, are you writing, is that what you mean about their, their alleged um, affection for one another? I mean, no I didn't come across any new groundbreaking evidence of that would probably be pretty disgusting um, physical evidence of... No. Uh, especially by this point. Put that on a 20. <laughs> so, no, I didn't. I mean, I do spend a more... I do spend a little bit of time on Ruben because he is so important to the actual story and because he's the one who reshaped the Continental Army into... Um, uh, a more or less effective fighting force and the whole reason he came here was because he was out of a job and and there were there were those like gay rumors about him that he had taken liberty with young boys in Prussia and so he was out of a job and because um, because Europe was at peace for a little bit longer all of the, the, you know, every professional soldier in Europe was scrambling for work and because he had this rumor hanging over his head and he was broke, that's why he came here. And he didn't have, um, he didn't have a commission when he left Europe. He just came here like hoping, you know, to get hired and hoping that rumor didn't follow him here. And I don't know, there's no, I, as far as I know, there's no conclusive evidence one way or the other. Um, I know the advocate refers to him as a confirmed bachelor. Um, and I mean, it's possible, maybe it's even probable he was a homosexual. And Randy Schultz writes in his book about gays and lesbians in the military that it's possible when um, von Steuben arrived at Valley Forge that he witnessed the first um, soldier being dismissed from, from the American military for homosexuality, a guy who was literally, literally drummed out of the camp, like with drums and stuff. So I don't, I, I don't know about um, Lawrence and Hamilton. They, they're, I read some of those letters and they are very affectionate. Um, I mean, they are, you know, in a war together and very good friends, who knows. Um, but uh, von Steuben, it, it's very possible, and that was you know, basically the reason he came here, whether he was gay or not. Um, so, I mean, certainly, like, up through past the Don't Ask, Don't Tell um, era, his was a really important story, especially to um, gay and lesbian soldiers, you know, because, I mean, so many of his, uh, his um, his drill manual, you know, that he wrote was um, officially part of the U.S. Army until the War of 1812, but much of what's in the Army's drill manual today carries over from him. And so his ideas um, about, you know, military order and discipline and, um, you know, training exercises and stuff were, have been part of the American military tradition from the get-go. So if, you know, gay and lesbian soldiers were being excluded, that is pretty hypocritical, you know. So I don't know, but with him it seems, I don't know, poss it definitely is possible. Maybe it's probable, but about the other guys, I'm not sure. There's a question on the end of a row right there. So earlier you mentioned this monument that was located somewhere locally regarding Lafayette, this mm -hmm. lamppost. And one of the fascinating things about your book is you look for these off the beaten path, for lack of a better term, landmarks. And as someone who took road trips as a kid, I can relate to that very much. So do you have a story about 
what you consider to be the strangest of these landmarks you've ever encountered, whether for research for one of your books or through your own travels? The strangest, I mean, some of the, I don't know about strangest, but some of the most perplexing are, well, I remember going to the McKinley Memorial in um, Canton, Ohio, and, you know, I mean, he was an assassinated president, and and I, I do remember that in the gift shop of the McKinley Memorial, the souvenir was a yo-yo. <laughs> so it's this incredibly, you know, uh, dull stone edifice to Ohio's assassinated president, one of them. And uh, that, was the, that was the memento was a yo-yo. I found that a little disrespectful. <laughs> I mean, probably the most disturbing to me was when I was writing that book about assassinations and coming across the memorial to John Wilkes Booth in Virginia that's sort of in this like highway median in Virginia. It's a really spooky and very reverential and kind of a memorial to him. It's not official. It looks pretty fishy, but some peop- it, it's there. And uh, that I found pretty creepy. Um, but you mean like light-hearted? Uh, <laughs> let me think. I mean, honestly, in my hometown, uh, one of the founders of the town, his name was Nelson Story, and he, he, was, he became the richest man in the Gallatin Valley, and partly because he started out, um, he had this t- cattle drive from Texas to Montana. He's I think the person um, Lonesome Dove is based on, and like I grew up on Story Street, and then his, either his son or his grandson, I can't remember, was still alive up, up until a few years ago, and you know, he, he, he was, this guy's just like shuffling around town, um, his name was Malcolm, he's a very nice man, just kind of walking around town in his plaid coat, and um, everybody knew him, everybody and their dogs, and then when he finally died, the town put up, because he, he had just lived till well into his 90s, you know, and the town put up a monument to him that was on the old property of the old Story Mansion, which is, became the middle school that I went to and was also, um, had been the high school before that, and like the high school where Gary Cooper went to high school and um, was on the grounds of the old Story Mansion. And so they put up this statue of Malcolm um, in like in his plaid coat, you know? And when that statue went up, my sister's dog went bananas for it, you know, because she remembered Malcolm, you know? And so every, because Malcolm was always walking around town and so was Lucy the dog, you know? And so it was so weird when Lucy sees like the statue Malcolm, you know? But I, I really like that, that the town just put up this monument to a guy everybody knew. <laughs> Because he was really old and we all grew up saying, hi, Malcolm. You know? <laughs> I don't know who put up that statue, but it's still, it's still there. We are going, we are only able to have, I'm afraid, one more question. I'm sure you will, uh, after that, join with me in thanking Sarah. Here you go. Whoever's got their hand up. There we go. Ooh, the pressure's on you, man. <laughs> There's a question about the two revolutions that Lafayette was involved in. Is it true that Jefferson was not entirely satisfied with his Declaration of Independence, and so when he was ambassador to France in uh, 1788 and 89, he and Jefferson together wrote, he and Lafayette together wrote the French Declaration of uh, Human Rights the rights of man and rights citizen. of man and they citizen. wrote a draft of it they wrote a draft of it um, together and then it was um, edited much like the Declaration of Independence was from Jefferson um, do you have some you want to give that guy the microphone he seems to have something to say about this it was Tom Bain who wrote the, Tom the Tom French uh, uh, rights oh watch out the the Declaration of, of Rights of the Man of Man and of the Citizen. I mean, various people contributed to that, but it was Lafayette and Jefferson who wrote one of the drafts. 
Ladies and gentlemen. Should we take one more question? I think that would be fantastic, actually. I think one more question would be a fantastic idea. There's somebody right in the front who's so near to us. That, but still, we're going to wait for the microphone. Thank you so much. Um, you kind of touched on it earlier, but I really enjoy books by yourself and Tony Horowitz because you guys meet everyday people and write so fondly about them, be it just a normal shop worker or somebody who's a tour guide. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have, meet somebody who's reluctant to take part in the book or somebody that needs prodding, or do you find that most people are eager to uh, share their thoughts with you? Um, no, it's usually uh, the opposite. I mean, I find there's, the, there's so much, especially like local knowledge is so helpful to me. And I mean, it was that way when I was a reporter writing about anything um, I, I remember when I was writing about the Oneida community and, you know, which is a 19th century biblical vegetarian sex cult. <laughs> and I think I had, um, maybe written them off a little bit. I mean, there are a lot of things about, it's where, their community is where the term free love comes from. And there are some eccentricities about their living arrangements. And I think I was, um, I had a lot of condescending feelings toward them and it just seemed too bizarre. And I wasn't really thinking about these people as people. I was there because um, President Garfield's assassin had lived among them for a while and I wanted to see where they had lived. And, and, um, and I mean, this place became, it was one of those, you know, utopian communities from the burned over district in upstate New York. And I was taking the tour from uh, a retired high school American history teacher who was a docent there. And he was talking to me about them. Uh, and he said, I've spent so much time, you know, it was the mansion house where they all lived. And he said, I've spent so much time here thinking about these people and why they would come here. And I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons they came there was because they had this idea that um, um, God had made them perfect and they should move upstate and sleep around. I don't know. But, <laughs> but he, he said he kept thinking, like, why would they come here? Why would they do this? I mean, it was, you know, they would, it was like the 1830s and 40s, and they were coming there, and, and they practiced group marriage, and it was very eccentric for the time and would be now, you know. And, um, I mean, I just basically kind of thought of it as, like, living in a big house with all of my weirdest college roommates, you know. <laughs> And, um, and he said he kept thinking about them and why they would do this, and then he was reading um, Jonathan Edwards, reading um, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it's, I mean, it's a great sermon, but it's pretty harsh and terrifying, and, you know, that, like, human beings are the sinners that, like, God is dangling over the fire, and um, how rigid... Of a, of a way of thinking about God was and, and how rigid um, the lives of the people who listen to such sermons and, you know, that form of Protestantism and Christianity. And he said, he thought, like, what if you were one of these people and these are the kind of sermons you're listening to and there was this place here where you could breathe and you could think of yourself not as an ugly, depraved sinner, you know, but you could think of yourself as a free person with value and will. And um, it really changed how I thought about these people, you know, and their ambitions for their own lives and to find this place that seemed so crazy and silly to me. And there are some disturbing things about it, but just that it was this place of refuge and freedom and community. And, um, you know, he really made them seem like someone I would know. Because the context is very important. Yeah. However yeah. weird things seem from a distance. Yeah. Or so, even I mean, there's, um, 
there's so much there there's so much knowledge out there and i think it comes back to what i was talking about about learning history maybe not necessarily always in class like that history comes from for me like talking to my grandfather or my father or my uncles or you know um people like that um there i'm obviously a writer and i'm in favor of you know literacy in the written tradition but there's something to be said for um you know passing down knowledge verbally and meeting meeting your fellow citizens you know even when when i was in it's the brand, history, when it? i was in the branding wine valley talking to those quakers who really were not excited about the idea of another war book coming into the world you know i was thinking i mean so much of my book is about the discord in american life and the only time we hear about these disagreements especially in the media is like when our congress shuts down the government or something or when people um show up at military funerals uh to uh protest um and you know all of these fights about abortion and stuff like that but when i was sitting in that meeting house in um the brandywine valley talking to the these friends um and we were you know laughing and joking and talking and they were telling me you know not just saying like we're against war but they were explaining like everything the people in that valley went through because of the war you know that their crops were taken by both sides by both armies their stuff was stolen um it was like a real hardship for the people of the place that it's not just they're like against war in the abstract there are real reasons to question the sanity of war you know and even though obviously i didn't give up on my quest to write about this warrior um just the idea that we were like having this very pleasant civil conversation with you know mild disagreements um like that to me is that kind of stuff you never hear no one's going to write a newspaper article about that you know but people can live amongst each other and learn from one another and you know sometimes um disagreements can be educational and even though you know i don't walk that quaker walk i think um or you know i think the book maybe walks a little differently because i mm. met them and so it's one thing i mean there are things to be learned from archives and and records and old letters and i use all of that but also just you know um talking to other people who have thought about these things um is really i think important and and useful and also pleasant <laughs> as this talk has been thank you so much she Pastor. will hold on a thank second hold so on. Hold on. she will be upstairs of course signing her book on behalf of the free library of philadelphia i'd like to thank very much and will you join me in thanking sarah vow um but let but i have a couple of questions one is it's just struck me when you were talking unless you're a quaker which is possible in this town it's it's probable and i'm i'm sorry that i was just glorifying violence <laughs> mostly. Okay, go ahead. Um that was a disclaimer. Let's come back to the Quakers in a moment. There's a lot about Quakers Can in we? your book. <laughs> um so uh just your description of the Quaker meeting. We'll need to go to to that. Yeah, that'll what be, we should have one. That'll be great on C-SPAN. We should just do it now. Just like a whole room full of people. No, that's what Q&A is going to be like. <laughs> like no one's going to say no anything. No one says anything and it's just the sound of a bunch of sneezes. Yeah. <laughs> denim on denim. Yeah, and the the visuals will just be like people look trying not to make eye contact. <laughs> Subtitle nobody moved to ask a question. <laughs> what what you know what you know you must do a lot of obviously a lot of research on your books. There must be big fat books there. Mhm. Mm on on your subject that you read obviously mm -hmm. and what you are doing as as now I've dubbed you the hits the hit story and I'm just going to keep going with it Don't. no okay but what <laughs> but what you what you're doing is you know you're taking the facts and you're taking the the urge to educate a little and the urge to amuse people because you are you know a comic writer also and you're taking 
your love of the history. And the first question I want to ask is, obviously, it's all an expression of you, but in what order do those things kind of topple out of you when you, you know, first thought of Lafayette? Are you waiting for the, the spark of an idea to come to you? Uh, and then when it does come, how, how do you keep those things in balance while you're doing it? Because that's what we love about you. I life. use an egg timer. No, I, I don't know. Like, it goes like, okay, I'm going to be educational now. Ding! Time for a jolty doke. Um, no, uh, I mean, those books you're talking about, <laughs> the funny thing is, is, I mean, I, I call them the books Republican dads get for Christmas, you know? <laughs> the, like, single subject book about a person, it's usually like the title, oh, the biography the title of the, yeah, it's a door stopper yeah. and yeah. usually the title is like a person's name and then, you know, when someone asks them what's the book about and then they'll say the person's name, yeah. <laughs> they won't have this like weird word like somewhat in their title but you're just like, oh my god, that's going to take 45 minutes to unravel. Um, I always kind of like in the beginning, that's sort of what I think I'm going to do, write this straight story. And like with, with Lafayette, I had written a little short piece um, for This American Life on public radio about that return trip, and it was very sentimental and fizzy, and it was all about, it was just kind of a love story and about uh, the American people's affection for Lafayette. And I just thought I was going to write this nice book about this nice French boy. And then, I don't know what, I mean, I never really think things through enough, I guess. I mean, for one thing, there's a war that he's in, so that's no fun. And then, I mean, the reason I was drawn to him was because, I mean, in 1824, the Civil War is kind of like starting to bubble up, you know. I mean, basically, it's now that I think about it, like the Civil War is bubbling up, you know, across town at Independence Hall, in 1774, like right at the beginning. And so the thing, like at Independence Hall, you know, the first Continental Congress, first thing that happens, the guy says, we should start with a prayer. Second motion is two Episcopalians standing up and saying, no way, I'm not going to, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not going to pray with these Quakers and Baptists and Congregationalists. We can't pray together. We have too many religions. Um, right there, All right, we'll give stragglers here a second to grab their seats. Uh, good evening, everyone. Before we begin, uh, most of our usual housekeeping, uh, please silence your cell phones. And also, we ask that you refrain from any photography, both here and during the awesome book signing that's going to take place immediately after this event in the main lobby. Uh, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, my name is Jason Freeman. and. A cool part of this job is getting to introduce writers that you like, and I'm excited to be here tonight to introduce Sarah Val. Uh, praised by the New York Times for her learned, or learned, uh, engagingly discursive, funny, sometimes even jolly romps through American history, cultural critic Sarah Val is a clear-eyed, funny, eviscerating observer of our history, foibles, and feats. She's the author of The Partly Cloudy Patriot, Take the Cannoli, personal favorite, uh, assassination, Vacation, and Unfamiliar Fishes, among other works. Uh, she was a contributing editor for This American Life, as well as one of the original contributors to McSweeney's. Uh, she has also been published uh, in a variety of periodicals, including The Village Voice, Esquire, The Los Angeles Times, and too many others to name. Uh, she has made numerous appearances on The Late Show with David Letterman, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Uh, Sarah's new book offers a frank portrait of the swashbuckling French hero of the American Revolution uh, and his insightful return to our young country. Uh, interviewing Sarah tonight is Wesley Stace, not only a frequent free library guest author, but also one of our favorite interviewers of writers on this stage. I tried counting today, it's six, seven, something like that times he's been here. Uh, he's the author of four critically acclaimed novels, including Misfortune, Charles Jesseld considered as a murderer, and most recently, Wonder Kid. You may also know Mr. Stace by his rock and roll nom de plume, John Wesley Harding, who was released, I guess 15 last time, it's a gajillion, awesome, uh, smart, fun folk rock albums. Uh, Wes is also the founder 
of uh, the Cabinet of Wonders radio variety show, which has released a who's who, uh, I'm sorry, which has featured a who's who of contemporary musicians, writers, comedians, and other sundry performers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before you uh, join me, uh, Sarah has said she's going to read for a minute, which is terrific for us. Uh, so now, won't you join me in welcoming Sarah Val and Wesley Stace to the Free Library of Philadelphia. <laughs> Hello, Philadelphia, um, and I'd also, um, you know, C-SPAN is here typing, so I'd also like to say hello to the five insomniacs <laughs> watching this at 5 a.m. on a Sunday. Um, I, I just wanted to read um, a little bit um, first because you can see what happens when I can sit and think about what I want to say and how I want to say it before I sit over there and just jibber-jabber, willy-nilly. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just read one little excerpt from the book. I think the only thing, and it's um, toward the end, so uh, the only thing maybe you would want to know uh, is about how the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, our beloved Revolutionary War hero from France uh, who came over in 1777 as a 19-year-old and um, was with Washington's army through Yorktown. In 1824, President Monroe invited the elderly Lafayette um, yell at our presidents. <laughs> or as um, George H.W. Bush once complained to Parade Magazine during the Gulf, Gulf War, um, he complained of the demonstrators who were beating those damn drums in front of the White House when I was trying to have dinner. <laughs> Of all the rallies, sit-ins, and acts of civil disobedience staged at Lafayette Square over the decades, I think we can agree that the one Americans should be the most proud of is the gathering of the Ku Klux Klan there in 1982. The three dozen or so, stay with me, the three dozen or so white supremacist dunderheads who showed up to demonstrate were provided police protection against the hordes of agitated counter-protesters pouring into the Capitol to demonstrate against their demonstration. Freedom of expression truly exists only when a society's most repugnant nitwits are allowed to spew their nonsense in public. And in Lafayette Park, distasteful speech is literally permitted, with permits issued by the National Park Service, the federal agency managing the site. It goes on from there, but, um, you know, you can read that later. <laughs> Shall I come over to... Yeah. Oh, oh, you're holding it like Oprah or something. <laughs> or like Robert Plant. Hmm. Is yours? Yeah. Is, it's, well, you, it can, works. You, you can just have yours then. Yeah, thanks. Um, don't tell me what to do with No, no, no. Um, so do you think, uh, when I'm listening to that, Lafayette. Would you think of him now, despite all those things that are named after him, those towns and the, the, the glory that comes with that kind of latter-day fame, mm -hmm. do you think of him now as an obscure character and, in a sense, was part of your point with the book with, like, you know, trying to let people know about him? Um, Wes is British. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> He hated British people. Well, I was going to say, many historical figures in America are obscure figures because we don't remember anything, <laughs> you know? So, yes, he's obscure, but, I mean, I guess maybe you should check with your teenagers if they know who, like, Ben Franklin is or something. Um, so is he an obscure figure? He has become one. I mean, he used to be this, he, I mean, maybe it was just the um, after effects from that trip in 1824, but I don't know if many of you have been to the Lafayette Monument in the Brandywine Valley that is 
uh, a little lamp look, a street lamp looking thing off the side of a road, but it's like Nowheresville in near Westchester. That sounds like a town, right? Um, and it's like in a lady's yard. I met her. She was really nice. And, but when they when they built that monument in 1895, after he had been dead for like 60 years, in 1895. 5,000 people showed up to celebrate this, not very impressive, no offense, um, <laughs> monument being put up. So um, I think, and then, you know, maybe the culmination of the Lafayette legend comes in World War I when, um, you know, France was in a bit of a pickle. And uh, when, the, when the American, the Allied Expeditionary Forces under General Pershing came, to uh, help out our old allies, the French, against the Germans. And they marched into Paris and they marched straight to Peak Pou Cemetery where Lafayette is buried. And um, one of the officers famously said, Lafayette, we are here. But after that, um, you know, people got busy. New, new heroes. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was Hitler. Different you know. wars. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he, in the, he used to be a, a bigger deal, obviously. Um, and he's, I'm not one of those writers who, I mean, I've certainly read some of these books where, you know, where the writer is like, my subject is so important. If he had never been born, there would have been a zombie apocalypse, you know. <laughs> I mean, he was important and certainly fascinating enough that, I mean, I wasted three years on him. Uh, <laughs> So he's up there, but I mean, in the revolutionary generation, it's kind of an embarrassment of riches. You know, you've got your Washington, your Jefferson, your beloved hometown boy Franklin. Um, you know, people are excited about Alexander Hamilton these days. Um, I'm maybe more partial to Henry Knox, the chief artillery officer. You just have, um, you know, John Adams. What about John Adams? James Madison. I mean, like. It's, I mean, even, I mean, it's, there, there's a lot of talent there, you know? But you're going for Knox. I mean, he's got to be the hipster's choice, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, he is, he's definitely the writer's choice right. because Henry Knox, as you know, uh, was uh, famously a bookseller in Boston, the owner of the London Bookshop. And um, he joined up with the, um, with the militia in, Ma in Massachusetts and eventually, uh, you know, when that morphed into the Continental Army, he was the guy during the siege of Boston who walked up, he was, he was a, I mean, think about the guy you buy your books from while I'm telling this story. Um, hopefully it's still a guy or a lady in a store. Um, yay! And uh, so, the book guy walks up to Washington and, I mean, you know, there's a siege in Boston and the British control the little peninsula of the city of Boston itself, but they're surrounded by all of these patriot militias that have kind of morphed into the Continental Army. And, um, and they get word that uh, Ethan Allen and um, Benedict Arnold who we still like at this point, have captured Fort Ticonderoga, which still has all these cannons and mortars and howitzers left over from the French and Indian War. And, um, and so in order to break this stalemate, they need not just better weapons, they need some weapons. And uh, the thing about heavy art artillery is it's heavy. And Henry Knox goes up to Washington and he says, my brother and I will go get that stuff. It's, you know, 300 miles away across the Berkshire Mountains and it's winter. And Washington's like, go ahead, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, a few weeks later, here the Knox brothers show up and they built these special sleds and they hauled, I don't know how many hundreds of tons of heavy artillery over the Berkshires to Boston and then the crafty Washington and, and his men in the middle of the night put them up on Dorchester Heights. And then the British down in Boston wake up the next morning impressed and... <laughs> 
they they leave by ship to Canada never to return. And so the moral of that story is never underestimate an independent bookseller. <laughs> I know which side the bread is buttered on. <laughs> okay, well, look, we'll, we'll get back to all this Lafayette stuff. In yeah. Moment. On the eve of the 50th anniversary of, of the um, revolution, to come back to America as the nation's guest, and it was quite a to-do. He, um, well, you remember what a big deal it was in Philadelphia. <laughs> and... You know, when he arrived in New York Harbor, 80-something thousand New Yorkers were there to meet his ship. And the population of New York was, I think, 123,000. So um, he has that on the Pope. Um, <laughs> most of the book is about his time in the war and a little bit about that return trip. But this is, um, I guess you could call it a tangent. <laughs> Nowadays, Lafayette is a place, not a person. Lafayette is a boulevard in Phoenix, a Pennsylvania college, and a bridge across the Mississippi in St. Paul. It's the Alabama birthplace of boxer Joe Lewis and three different towns in Wisconsin, four if Fayette counts. If so, then it is also Fayette County, which the Chicken Ranch, better known as the best little whorehouse in Texas, put on the map. It is without question Lafayette, Indiana, where the founders of both C-SPAN and Guns N' Roses were born. When I bumped into an old neighbor whilst visiting my Montana hometown, she asked me what I was working on, and I answered a book about Lafayette. So she inquired if I would be spending a lot of time in Louisiana. And I was confused, wondering if she forgot that Thomas Jefferson decided against his initial impulse of appointing Lafayette as the former French colony's first governor after the Louisiana Purchase. But then I realized that the city of Lafayette, Louisiana must be her go-to Lafayette labeled noun. <laughs> Even though from Montana, it's actually a closer drive to Lafayette, Utah, not to mention the ones in Oregon, California, Kansas, and Colorado. So I explained that I meant Lafayette, the French teenager who crossed the Atlantic on his own dime to volunteer to fight with George Washington in the Revolutionary War. Therefore, I said, I was more likely to visit Pennsylvania Pennsylvania, where he got shot. <laughs> she nevertheless professed her fondness for Zydeco. <laughs> this encounter aroused such indignation in my breast that I moralized upon the instability of human glory and the evanescence of many other things. <laughs> No, wait, that's what Herman Melville did in 1870 when a random stranger in a cigar store had never heard of his Revolutionary War hero grandfather. When I found out my old neighbor had never heard of my Revolutionary War hero protagonist, I went and got a taco with my sister. <laughs> Still, it does seem eerie how one day in 1824, two-thirds of the population of New York City was lining up to wave hello to Lafayette, and 19 decades go by, and all that's left of his memory is the name of a Cajun college town. Thanks to the nationwide euphoria over the elderly Lafayette's return tour of the United States in 1824, countless American streets, parks, cities, counties, schools, warships, horses, and babies bear his name. The long list includes Scientology founder Lafayette Ronald L. Ron Hubbard and my Arkansas-born great-great-uncle Lafayette Hines, who went by fate for short. The most meaningful namesake by far is Lafayette Square across the street from the White House, also known as Lafayette Park. This is the nation's capital of protest, the place where we, the people, gather to yield.